afternoon. Would you please state your names for the uh, uh, record, please, for the Hansard? Erna Buena, the Ontario Nurses Association. And Lawrence Walter, Government Relations Officer. You have 10 minutes for your presentation. Thank you and good afternoon. I'm Erna Buena, a health and safety workers' compensation specialist for the past 16 years at the Ontario Nurses Association, or ONA. With me today is Lawrence Walter, ONA's government relations officer. ONA is Canada's largest nursing union, representing 60,000 registered nurses, RNs, and allied health professionals, as well as more than 14,000 nursing student affiliates, providing quality patient care each and every day across the healthcare sector. While ONA supports the government's efforts to move forward with presumptive legislation for post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, ONA must express our disappointment with the government for excluding frontline nurses from coverage under Bill 163. This exclusion ignores both the growing experience of nurses with extremely violent and traumatic incidents in their workplace and the findings in the literature showing that the traumatic experiences that nurses face at work are closely linked with PTSD. ONA is calling on the government and the Standing Committee to adopt the model used in Manitoba's recent presumptive legislation, the leading province on presumptive legislation regarding PTSD. Manitoba is the first province that does not limit the occupations eligible to make a workers' compensation claim for PTSD, clearly includes nurses, and the Manitoba legislation presumes PTSD is the result of workplace trauma unless proven otherwise. At a minimum, nurses must be included as an occupation covered under Bill 163. Bill 163 excludes coverage for predominantly female occupations in healthcare, such as nurses, and provides entitlement solely for first responder male predominant occupations. Yet nurses are recognized as first responders under the 2013 legislation that proclaimed May 1 as First Responders Day in Ontario. We ask, why exclude nurses considering that healthcare occupations are a leader in lost time claims for violence related injuries? 11% of healthcare lost time injuries are from workplace violence. There were 680 lost time injuries in 2014, up from 639 in 2013. This is especially unacceptable in a workplace culture of acceptance where the incidence of violence and harassment, including sexual harassment, will not soon end and with the mental trauma and injury that naturally flow from these and other healthcare psychosocial hazards, including exposure to infectious diseases such as SARS and Ebola. In fact, Dr. John Bradford, a renowned forensic psychiatrist, has corresponded with ONA to state his expert opinion that it is incredulous to Dr. Bradford that nurses would not be covered under Bill 163. Dr. Bradford argues that nurses are in more frontline situations of exposure to trauma than many first responders. Secondly, Dr. Bradford argues that first responders are exposed to acute events that are easily, usually easier to recover from, even in the case of repeated exposure to these type of acute events. Whereas nurses are much more likely to be exposed to chronic trauma, which is more subtle, becomes chronic PTSD, and this is more difficult to treat in the longer term. We agree that nurses, at a minimum, must be covered under Bill 163 as a result of the day-to-day -day traumatic incidents and carnage of violence, sickness, suffering, and death that all nurses in all areas deal with every day. A comprehensive 1996 Manitoba study of PTSD among nurses includes violence at work as one of the most commonly cited stressors that lead to PTSD. Others include death of a child, particularly due to abuse, treating patients that resemble family or friends, death of a patient or injury to a patient after undertaking extraordinary efforts to save a life, and heavy patient loads. There appears to be a disconnect in the minister's announcement for establishing a workplace violence leadership table in Ontario in which they recognize workplace violence as a serious hazard. However, at the same time, the Minister of Labour has introduced presumptive PTSD legislation that excludes nurses from the very piece of legislation that can at least provide nurses with early medical treatment and compensate nurses for lost rate wages resulting from psychological illnesses sustained 
from the acknowledged violence and traumatic events in their workplaces. Why is treating and compensating nurses when the health and safety system in their workplace fails not important to the Minister of Labour? It is estimated that 14% of all nurses exhibit some type of PTSD symptom four times higher than the general adult population. As many as 25% of critical care nurses and 33% of emergency nurses have screened positive for PTSD symptoms. In studies in Manitoba, medical services nurses experienced a PTSD prevalence of 34.8%. In a replication study of RNs working in emergency and in intensive care units, the analysis revealed a PTSD prevalence of 42.1%. In a 2005 study from the University of British Columbia of 107 hospital emergency nurses, 21.7% reported clinically significant post-traumatic stress symptoms. The work events most frequently cited as traumatic were involving assault or threats of assault and events involving severe injuries to children. Other triggers were events involving or reminding of family or friends, traumatic medical events such as excessive bleeding or prolonged resuscitation followed by death, and multiple simultaneous traumatic events. In a further study, all nurses who met the diagnostic criteria for PTSD experienced traumatic events, including witnessing patient death, massive bleeding, open surgical wounds, trauma-related injuries, and performing futile care to critically or terminally ill patients. The Ontario Hospital Association reports more than 6,400 incidents of workplace violence in Ontario in 2015. For 2013-14, a report from a Toronto hospital shows there were 502 violent incidents reported of which 297 involved RNs. At a Toronto mental health facility, 514 reports of violent incidents were documented in that year. That is over 1,000 violent incidents in two Toronto hospitals. These are reports of violent incidents where agitated patients are biting, scratching, spitting, stabbing, punching nurses. Nurses are being beaten beyond recognition, punched in the face, in the chest, in the stomach. They're kicked, bones are broken, tackled and assaulted. One nurse had her finger amputated in a violent assault by a patient. Another nurse screaming for help. Excuse me. Screaming for help was dragged from the hospital out towards, sorry, yeah. out towards busy Toronto oncoming traffic, only to be saved by construction workers who heard her screams for help over their jackhammer. Sorry. So let me conclude with three other horrific examples from Ona WSIP cases. Nurses from a large Eastern Ontario hospital witnessed and were part of a code white where a worker was grabbed, thrown up against a shadow box, fell unconscious, was beaten, punched repeatedly while nurses tried desperately to get the patient off their coworker before the patient killed the nurse. The nurses subsequently suffered PTSD, lost time, and had the lost time denied by the WSIB. A nurse was grabbed by the neck by a patient. The patient flung her to the ground and was about to hit her face with a punch while hanging her upside down when a porter stuck a hand between her face and the patient's fist and blocked the hit. This nurse was denied PTSD by WSIB, but eventually won an appeal many years later. The nurse could never return to her unit. No nurse who suffered such a personal injury should have to go through this process. A patient in a Toronto hospital grabbed a nurse and locked her in a visitor's room. The patient said that first he was going to beat her, then he was going to rape her, then he was going to kill her. The patient did beat her beyond recognition, while others watched helplessly and could not get in the room. The patient started to rip off the nurse's clothes. The nurse believed she would die. A co-worker was able to break into the room and saved her life. This nurse will never return to work. These examples of traumatic events experienced by nurses should never happen in our healthcare workplaces, but they do. Nurses should not have to continually relive these horrific and traumatic events to prove entitlement to WSIB benefits. We ask the Standing Committee and the government to make sure this never occurs again by including nurses in Bill 163. We ask that Bill 163 also include physicians as being able to make a PTSD diagnosis, especially since early recognition and treatment is key to prevention and ever being able to return to work. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, we'll start with the government. Thank you, Mr. Thank you Cole. for a uh, very difficult presentation. Uh, how many um, cases or how many, uh, you might say, appeals go before the WSIB in a year uh, by nurses? Uh, any Thank data you, on sir. that in the last couple of years or the last year you have? How many applied for? Uh, it's, uh, as the firefighter said, it's very difficult for them to come forward. We know uh, that we have a large percentage of claims as well that are going before the actual amount, I, I can't say. The interesting thing is that we try to check with WSIB how many are actually being denied and they don't make that uh, data available, surprisingly. <coughs> so many of the nurses, uh, if they do actually file claims, don't necessarily come to us to assist them in the appeals, right? They may go, uh, they may appeal themselves, they may go outside elsewhere, but I can tell you that I personally have done workers' compensation appeals and that they have been denied. We've had, and it's not just workplace violence, it's also um, exposure to chemicals. We had a nurse who was exposed to a glutaraldehyde, a chemical, and she thought, and not thought, but she saw her patients dying off sooner because of this chemical exposure. And so anyway, she thought she was going to die. That claim took 10 years to allow at the WSIB and having to relive. She can't step foot on the property of that hospital as a result of that incident. You know, another nurse in community who was in a head-on car collision, rolled her car down a hill and could never get into a car again. We had to fight and we won that claim as well for PTSD. The SARS nurses, the nurses who heroically protected the public from SARS, who filed claims, all had their claims denied for PTSD at the WSIB when the WSIB gave employers in the province who dealt with SARS a break on their experience rating claims. Yeah, and I remember I got a call from a nurse in my writing who was in the SARS unit that uh, North York General, and she told me how she was exposed to SARS without protection, and she went to her supervisors, and she wasn't getting any kind of uh, support from them. And uh, and I, I think I remember talking to the Toronto Star about it at the time. But I just wanted to say, uh, this all this horrific violence that is occurring, why um, is this an increase, and why the increase? And they seem to be, you know, very very. Uh, incredible levels of uh, hostility uh, in the workplace. Uh, what's happening there? Well, I think we've got a mental health crisis out there. So the sick of the sickest are coming into our workplaces with respect to workplace violence. You have to either be a risk to yourself or to the public in order to actually get treatment and be formed in a hospital. So the early treatment centers that used to exist that people could get early treatment for aren't, so they're coming into our facilities now. And you th a lot of them are really the result of people that have existing mental health issues that uh, yeah. border on the uh, violent tendencies. I'd say it's both. It's not just uh, mental health. I, I would hate to even try to stigmatize that. Yeah. It's, it's both. We've got angry people angry at wait times. You know, you're talking about people who are seeing their loved ones possibly dying, right? Like in front of them, and they want service. They want it then, and yet, you know, the nurses have to triage. They have to triage based and they, on. They take it out on the nurses that are trying to help. Absolutely, absolutely. And they're exposed to, I mean, code blues. They see babies being brought into the emergency, babies being, you know, brought into the ICU, babies who are dying, who have been physically assaulted and then die before them and the grieving parents. And I mean, it's awful what they have to experience. And it's just repeated over and over and over again. Or witnessing a stillbirth as a nurse. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank for your you. Presentation. Thank you. Any other government questions? You've got about 40 seconds. No? Okay, we go to the official opposition. Ms. Marto. Uh, thank you very much, and um, I really appreciate your heartfelt presentation. I know that's very hard, and I think you, you know, alluded a little bit with the member opposite that um, uh, the stress doesn't just come from being assaulted, but for, as nurses, what you have to uh, see in terms of you know, violence against patients, but also in terms of just patients who unfortunately uh, meet with an accident or an illness. And we heard yesterday th some data that um, some of the first responder groups had done that, uh, in terms of the number of post-traumatic stress incidents 
in their membership versus the general population? And do you have anything to share with us in terms of, because, you know, in my opinion, the nurses, um, it's, it's a pretty stressful job, and let's leave it at that. Well, the literature that we referred to is in our submission as well, and you can see there's numerous literature that deals with post-traumatic symptoms in nursing, so I don't think uh, that anyone could, you know, dispute the actual literature that's out there. And as I said, I have personal experience dealing with the uh, people who, the nurses, who have actually had cases denied at ONA, and we've got several examples of that as well in our submission. So uh, to have to relive over and over and over, we had a nurse just stabbed, you know, at a workplace recently, you know, and w the people who had to witness that, we had a shooting at one of the hospitals and the nurses who were scrambling to save the little kids and the patients in the emergency room, all of those people, I sat across the table from those people that they've all, you know, filed WSIB claims for that. I mean. Right now, we're just waiting to see what's going to happen. I'm anticipating those are not going to be allowed. We couldn't even get the Ministry of Labor in there to protect them. Like, it was very difficult to actually, you know, to actually deal with that, but they filed these claims. So we already know, we can anticipate which claims are going to be denied, and those are typical of the type of claims that are denied. And um, also, you know, in terms of um, the timing that uh, right now, you know, the, the focus has been on the 24 month. Um, do you have any comments on the time frame for claims or for, for symptoms? Oh, I absolutely agree with uh, the last speaker that there, I mean, I would not, I mean, just based on my experience of doing WSIB claims and how long it can take to manifest PTSD, and particularly for our members, it can take years for it to manifest. So I would, I, I mean, we were just talking about this before we came, and I thought that 24-month mark is not right. It's not right. So I would highly recommend not putting, uh, and not putting a limitation on it. I know you probably are thinking that there needs to be, but you know, definitely as the previous speaker, speaker said, extend it. I would not go any, any less than five years. And thank I'm you. Sorry to okay. say with that. I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now to the third party, Ms. French. Thank you, and, and thank you very much for your presentation. Um, certainly um, appreciated your, your passion, and, and on this International Women's Day, I also appreciate that you pointed out, um, you know, nursing is a predominantly female profession, and so here we have a group that has been recognized on official First Responders Day in Ontario, but not uh, included in this piece of legislation, which I think is a mistake. Um, you know, certainly we, you know, we appreciate where you're coming from, um, and we'll push to, to have you included under this presumption. Interesting um, and, and positive that uh, the correctional officers or correctional nurses have been included, um, which is great, but to expand that to um, all of our first responders, all of our nurses. Um, thank you also for um, expanding on, on just how traumatizing in and of itself, not just re-traumatizing, the WSIB process is. I think that that's an important thing for the government to take away from this whole process mm -hmm. so that um, when you are covered by the presumption, hopefully, uh, that there will be others still uh, making their way through the system. Thank you for advocating mm -hmm. on their behalf as well. Um, are there Ontario studies? You, you mentioned about Manitoba, uh, which also is a province with uh, presumptive legislation that covers frontline workers, all of them. Um, so are there Ontario studies that we can draw from with your stati for statistics or nursing? For statistics, well, ONA actually did a survey, uh, not on PTSD, but just on workplace violence, and uh, this was uh, in 2009. So 54% of our members during that survey actually indicated that they had been physically abused. And is that something that you've provided to the government in this submission? It's in our have a say. I don't know if uh, uh, I'm sure it, they would is it in the submission, but uh, it, it's so widely accepted that the government established a workplace violence leadership table in healthcare. Hmm. So I mean, I don't know that we have to even prove it anymore. Why would both the government, the Minister of Labor and Health, have established this table if it wasn't recognized? Yes, Ms. Forster. So um, why is it that you think the government didn't include nurses uh, as part of this bill? Is it, is it because there were a thousand uh, violent incidences, um, or, uh, you know, just in 
Toronto hospitals in a one or two year period? Um, you know, um, is it because there would be uh, too many people uh, coming forward uh, claiming PTSD rightly? I think uh, both. I think that it's a female dominated workplace and we seem to see so much emphasis on construction and mines and you know all the male dominated workplaces and yet uh, you know the female dominated workplace it's like this exception it's accepted that you know we're being beat up as part of the job. So I think both definitely. <laughs> Uh, you know, I don't know. It, it makes no sense to me because the government is saying on one breath that they are supporting nurses, that they're trying to, they understand the, the extent of the problem in health care. They know that something needs to happen, and yet in another breath they are not willing to compensate the female-dominated, you know, workers in these workplaces. That and makes no that, sense. And with that, I'm sorry to say you're out of time. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation.